I, I really couldn't be more enthusiastic about the taking up this new position or appreciative of the reception I've gotten. Um, I, I'm beginning to spend more time here so that I can uh, make contact with old friends and meet uh, people more broadly across the University of Chicago community. It'll only be a couple of months before we're really in full gear, but I'd say we're accelerating rapidly even before then. Uh, so the, the point of today is really to introduce myself to you scientifically, not to talk broadly about the Institute, but <clears throat> I'm having many interesting and informative discussions with people about the Institute. So let me launch right in. Uh, we're talking, I'm going to be talking about these objects that we've come to call protein analogous micelles for two reasons. One is they're about the size and shape of proteins and they have some of the properties, structural and functional, of, of proteins. And we believe that they can be useful in, in a variety of uh, biomedical kinds of applications. <clears throat> I've listed the primary people uh, who work I'm going to talk about today. They're pictured here. Uh, Mark Kastantin, Matt Black, Dimitri Masirlis, uh, Rachel Marulo, Amanda Trent, and Brian Lynn. Um, this work's largely been supported by uh, both NIH and the MRSEC uh, at UC Santa Barbara. So um, <laughs> what we really started on uh, about a decade ago was a way in which we could conjugate peptides, small pieces, small functional and structurally interesting pieces of proteins uh, with lipids or fatty acids so that we could control the display of these peptides at interfaces to uh, have them endowed with certain intrinsic molecular characteristics that dictated their organization from the molecular architecture so that they would spontaneously form structures of interest. And what we invented, if, if, if it merits that uh, description, was a robust kind of chemical synthesis route to take any peptide that could be made by step-by-step -by -step <clears throat> kind of uh, polymerization on a solid phase resin and conjugating it to either a natural or synthetic hydrophobic tail. And that hydrophobic tail creates hydrophobic interactions that uh, are the essence of the self-assembly character that we're trying to induce. Small peptides, and the peptides we're talking about typically are somewhere between 5 and 30 amino acids long, generally do not have much structure all by themselves, and they don't have an easy capacity to form structure except under certain cases. Whereas Peptides conjugated to lipid tails can create a whole bunch of engineered, interesting engineered objects. We really went into this with an initial emphasis on uh, surface modification, as indicated in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, if you take a molecule that has a hydrophilic uh, peptide head group and a hydrophobic tail and put it in contact with a piece of hydrophobic plastic, it knows which end is up. It puts its hydrophobic tail down, packs at a certain density, and can display a multifunctional set of peptides. Uh, we know a lot about the phase behavior. So we can make either homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures on surfaces. And that's sort of the way we started out. And we published things on that, and I'm not going to dwell on that here. It's only a small step from there to the object on the right, which is a bilayer, uh, which can also form spontaneously in solution. And you should look at the length scales here. <clears throat> the length scale bar on that liposome on the right is 10,000 times bigger than the scale bar on the left. If I had drawn that liposome at the scale of the thing on the left, that liposome would have surrounded the, the Gordon Center. Um, so on the scale of peptides, and, and every picture we draw of these things is wildly inaccurate, uh, on the scale of the peptide molecules, uh, those surfaces are flat too. So the top two represent uh, examples of flat surfaces formed when the size and interaction balance between the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic part of the molecule are about equal in some ways so that they are form stable flat surfaces. But in the course of doing this, we've become uh, more interested in this object um, on the uh, bottom here that we've come to call protein analogous micelles. And again, there's a big factor of, of difference in length scale. Thank you. Thank you. I got it. There's, there's a, again, a big difference in length scale. And the difference between this structure and this one is that all the hydrophobic tails are together here in the middle displaying a corona of peptides. And again, it can be a multifunctional 
highly multivalent corona of peptides. So these things form spontaneously in solution at a critical micelle concentration. You put them in solution and raise them above a certain concentration and you get micelles if the uh, molecular architecture is right. And we've come to realize that these have both some interesting properties, as I said, structural and functional, but also utility. Um, the analogy isn't all that deep, but it's sort of interesting, I think. First of all, as I said, if we're talking about spherical micelles and globular proteins, they're about the same size, single digit nanometers in, in characteristic dimension. Uh, proteins fold by putting their hydrophobic uh, residues in the middle and their biologically active uh, parts and, that are hydrophilic on the outside. And proteins function by having a um, region that has usually a very well-defined secondary structure like helical to hold the parts of the protein in the right positions in order to do the job that they do. And you'll see that in these, you'll see very directly that in these micelles, even though the peptides that we're looking at are disordered by themselves, in micelles, the peptides typically take on ordered secondary structures again, which is interesting and useful. So those are some of the similarities. There are differences, and I'm mainly trying to highlight the uh, uh, positive or the favorable differences. I mean, there's, there's really unfavorable differences too. That is, enzymes really work. And it's really, <laughs> it's really hard to get a micelle to act like an enzyme. Uh, so let's be frank about that. But uh, for certain kinds of things that are benefited by high multivalency, by that I mean a large number of peptides in close proximity to one another and multifunctionality, in general, you could have multiple copies of multiple peptides that can do, uh, perform different tasks in the same assembly. Uh, there are some things that, that one can do. There is a central hydrophobic reservoir for delivery so that hydrophobic molecules such as drugs that don't dissolve directly in water can be uh, embedded in the region. And as we'll talk about, when we start thinking about these things in a therapeutic sense, these are nanoparticles that can come apart easily. Uh, they can be taken apart by biological processes or they can be stimulated to come apart uh, by some other kind of process so that they can release things or enter into cells, not necessarily as the whole particle, but as individual molecules, which can be useful too if you're trying to deliver uh, a therapeutic peptide from the corona here. So if you want to start jumping ahead mentally, you know, you could think about a particle here that has a peptide or you know, 20 peptides in it. A, a, a micelle like this has 80 to 100 molecules in it. So that's the sort of numbers you should be thinking about. It might have a third of them that are there for targeting, a third of them that are there to help uh, membrane fusion and crossing the membrane into the cell, and another third that are designed to deliver some kind of therapeutic peptide. That's the kind of generic kind of example that we're heading toward in this work. We have, we have a long way to go. Um, so. Uh, and then there's other aspects of micelle design that I'm going to talk about as we go along. The first one I'm going to pick up is the one that I mentioned uh, to you uh, briefly already, namely that disordered peptides by themselves start to take on order when they're part of a micellar assembly. This in turn affects their function. And this was really the, the first kind of idea that led us to talk about protein analogous micelles in this way. That is, <clears throat> you can start to get activities that aren't just the sum of all the peptides there, you know, that's not just simple multiplication, but rather something, some kind of emergent behavior that happens from the micelle that doesn't happen from the equivalent number of peptide uh, molecules. Um, controlling uh, the geometry of micelles is quite important. And then, you know, the flip side of the fact that they can come apart is the fact that they might come apart too soon uh, for certain applications because in many of those applications you're injecting them into a dilute medium. Uh, and so one has to think about how one needs or wants to control the stability. So all of these issues will be the ones that I address in, in going through this talk. So let, let's talk about a detail here and, and I'll amplify on it in, in a minute. Um, Here's a uh, um, seven amino acid peptide um, written in the, the single letter code, which is one that even by itself has some tendency toward helix formation. Uh, the helix formation gets 
uh, more apparent as one lengthens the peptide. So if you put uh, two or three heptads of, together, so have a 14 or a 21 amino acid peptide, you get more and more structure. I want to show you what happens when you do the simple thing of adding a hydrophobic tail to these peptides and how that changes the, the structure of the peptide. Uh, well, I'll be showing from time to time uh, data derived from circular dichroism, which is a common average technique for looking at peptide structure. It it's, uh, compares the absorption coefficients of right and left circularly polarized light. So it's sensitive to different kinds of chirality or organization in proteins and peptides. And the signature of an alpha helix is this double negative peak with negative peaks at 222 and, and 208. This particular uh, uh, amino acid sequence if it forms helices, also forms amphipathic helices, which means uh, they have a hydrophobic face and a hydrophilic face. So they tend to associate in this kind of coiled coil kind of arrangement, uh, as, I, as I mentioned here. But let's just look at the basic CD spectra of 1, 2, 3, and 4 heptads. And you can see, again, comparing, I didn't explicitly point it out, but this is what a disordered uh, 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 I should have said disordered here because I'm using the term coil in sort of two different ways. This means random coil. Uh, so it has this big negative peak here. And you can see that the short uh, sequences of this amino acid are uh, rather disordered. But as you get to three and four, you start to see the appearance of alpha helical structure in the peptide alone. Whereas if you attach um, a, a hydrophobic tail, uh, you don't get much uh, in the uh, uh, situation of one heptad. In fact, though, you don't get disorder either. What you get in this particular case is a beta sheet arrangement, and that's a detail that I don't want to dwell on. But you can see that uh, with two, three, and four, you get much more structural order. You also, if you heat these things, get very stable uh, helices. Um, the, the shorter amino acids do tend to associate laterally and form beta sheets, and I'll, I'll come back to that again. Uh, but in fact, the C12, 3, and 4 heptads have very stable alpha helices that can retain an alpha helical structure up to 70 degrees, at which point many, many uh, proteins are denatured, and certainly short peptide sequences would melt. These disorders somewhat by the elevating of these things. But if you cool them back down again, they, they reassemble, whereas some of these others uh, are not capable of doing that. So mycelization uh, it enhances the structure of, of short peptides. And that means if the peptides are functional, and their function depends upon structure, one can also, with micelles, deliver these things sometimes in a much more functional uh, and, and therefore if, it's, if the function is therapy or binding or something, a much more uh, functional way. Uh, why is this? Um, and uh, the, the short answer to this is that a free peptide has lots of configuration space that it can explore, lots of translational entropy, whereas uh, a helical peptide like this in the whole protein is constrained by the rest of the tertiary structure of the, of the protein and therefore uh, orders. We think of mycelization as kind of reimposing a kind of artificial tertiary structure on, on the peptide. And one can do some reasonable statistical mechanical calculations to bear that out. <clears throat> so let, let me now move into the, that was uh, structure, let me move into the functional aspects of this. One of the things we thought about when we said, OK, we can make an object that has 80 to 100 functional peptides and we can deliver it in a kind of a functional way, what kind of functions might we want to deliver with this? And we've, we've been working on a couple. Antimicrobial peptides, peptides that kill bacteria, are, are one, and it, it actually works quite effectively. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, we've been trying uh, hard, without as much success, but with some limited success, to try to use these micelles as something like uh, synthetic vaccines to raise antibodies to certain kinds of peptides that would not have some of the downsides of viruses as a way of, uh, of uh, stimulating the immune system. Um, but the other one we thought about was DNA binding. And so we looked at uh, um, you know, the structures of some of the most common 
DNA binding peptides, um, looking particularly at the, at the class of transcription factor proteins, and took a sequence out of a common um, uh, transcription factor. It's a yeast transcription factor known as GCN4, very, very well studied for decades, uh, that has a basic sequence that is designed, uh, sorry, a basic sequence that is designed to bind specific sequences of DNA, and then we added to it, uh, in fact, the same seven amino acids that I just showed you, something to nucleate these things into this kind of coiled coil arrangement, and then started to look at the behavior of these things by themselves and in the presence of DNA um, after we had conjugated them to either di C16 or mono C16 hydrophobic tails. They have well-defined critical micelle concentrations that we can measure. This measures uh, when uh, pyrene, which is a very high hydrophobic molecule, finds a hydrophobic pocket that it can dissolve in. That's the onset of the, of the micelle formation, which is at about 5 micromolar for the di C16 and about 40 micromolar for the mono C16. And then we do circular dichroism on these things again. In this case, the, the peptide alone shows some semblance of, of helical order. That is, there's two things that you could call negative peaks, but if you analyze this according to common kinds of quantitative methods, you find that this thing is about 30% helical. But even more indicative, if you put this peptide all by itself in the presence of DNA, it becomes completely disordered. So it doesn't do anything like is envisioned in any of these pictures of coiled coils binding the major groove of DNA. What it probably does, since our peptide is largely cationic and DNA is negatively charged, sort of hydrophobic, uh, electrostatically collapses in, into a complex with DNA and that disorders it further. But if you start looking at the uh, hydrophobically modified peptides, and in particular uh, when you go above the CMC, uh, you uh, have very highly alpha helical peptides in these micelles. Um, and in fact, when you put these uh, hydrophobic, hydrophobically modified uh, assembled uh, peptides in the presence of DNA, and in fact, I, I didn't say it, but we know that these things form worm-like micelles in this particular case, uh, and then you put it in the presence of DNA, you get sort of the textbook picture of highly alpha helical. So in other words, now we have a helical peptide interacting, or a pair of helical peptides, interacting with DNA and uh, retaining its helical structure. Even more convincing about this, and I, th I think maybe the, the interesting aspect of this, of sort of non-simple uh, multiplicative behavior of the peptides, is uh, these um, uh, gel shift assays, where what we're doing, I'll just show you, the, talk about the pictures here for a second. Uh, we're dragging DNA from the bottom to the top of this in the presence of increasing amounts of our peptide amplifile here, um, in, in this case mono C16, in this case di C16. And what you can see is as you increase the concentration, not much happens. There isn't much binding of these things to DNA, at least that affects the mobility. And then at some concentration of our peptide amplifile, the DNA stops. That concentration is the critical micelle concentration. So in other words, these peptides do nothing, no matter how much of them you put in there right up to the CMC. And at the CMC, they form a micelle, which drives the head groups into an active secondary structure, which can then perform the function of, of these uh, intended of these peptides. So that's what I mean by a kind of emergent behavior or kind of a non-extrapolated uh, behavior just from the number of peptides that we have there. Uh, we can do things, as I said, that involve multiple peptides. That's why there's sort of two colors here. But let me shift gears now from the, let's say, uh, physical chemistry structure function kind of things to things that we might do that are uh, of some practical, uh, possibly eventually clinical significance. And that is to try to use this kind of object to create a multifunctional um, nanoparticle for treating some kind of uh, pathological tissue. And I'm going to show you examples from both cancer and from uh, atherosclerosis, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, 
Uh, this is a picture that's 10 years old now, uh, where my former uh, Santa Barbara colleague, Erki Ruslati, uh, was envisioning uh, if you could have small nanoparticles um, that had targeting elements on them, they could move through blood vessels and respond to what he calls vascular zip codes, some kind of signal that's displayed in the inside of the vasculature that uh, these things could home to that would, uh, in fact, enable it to target, possibly help diagnose and treat um, cancer. So we're specifically talking about a, a tumor blood vessel here. Uh, and, uh, you know, not to uh, get off the science and back into my history, but uh, one of the best things that happened during my tenure at UC Santa Barbara is that uh, Erki Ruslati moved from the Burnham Institute in San Diego to the UC Santa Barbara campus. And we sort of began a collaboration in about 2005 based on this picture with our micelles being uh, these kind of particles. And Erki uh, doing uh, what's known as in vivo phage display uh, to find peptides that would target pathological tissue. So he put this kind of virus into the bloodstream, displaying libraries of peptides that would home to um, pathological tissue by virtue of the peptides displayed in a particular region of this virus. And then he would figure out what viruses, what, what peptides those were, and screen and amplify and so on. And in that way, he discovered uh, several kinds of interesting peptides that would home to things. And I'm just going to talk about one of them with some intimations about a couple of others. And that's this five amino acid peptide, cysteine, arginine, glutamate, lysine, alanine. Not all peptide sequences are pronounceable, but this one has the consonants and the vowels in the right place, and we call it CRECA. And it homes to um, blood clots. It homes to some epitope in fibrinogen, which ends up in fibrin blood clots. And most tumors, because of rapid growth, have blood clots in them, so to re kind of uh, interpret this picture, you know, think about these targeting particles, uh, um, targeting uh, small uh, uh, fibrin patches uh, on the inside of leaky blood vessels. And the, the fibrin is there because the blood vessels are leaking and they want to clog the leaks. Um, so uh, here's where we started to do a little molecular structural engineering on these peptides. Uh, we uh, want to know where these peptides go when we inject them in uh, to an animal or, or some other kind of system. So we put a green fluorescent label here. We also want to have small spherical particles in this case, and this goes right back to some basic uh, polymer and surfactant physics where we know that if the hydrophilic corona of these things is large compared to the tail, that'll enforce the kind of curvature that drives these things into spherical micelles. And so instead of just coupling the peptide directly to the hydrophobic tail, we put a relatively long 2,000 molecular weight hydrophilic polyethylene glycol polymer spacer there. That swells in water because it's very water soluble and drives these CRECA molecules toward the exterior. As I, again, as I said, um, no picture anybody has ever drawn about a polymer molecule is really accurate, and we certainly don't have all the Karekas right out there, but it does tend to enhance their accessibility, and also it tends to drive these things into uniform spherical particles with a radius of about 8 nanometers. Um, and then we have begun animal experiments. So the idea here then is um, we create a mouse tumor model by xenografting, injecting basically, uh, breast tumor tissue into a mouse and allowing it to engraft for several weeks. And then when we're ready to the, do the experiment, we inject uh, our suspension of micelles into the tail vein of the mouse. So we're not doing this injection near the site of the pathology. Uh, it goes in pretty far away and circulates through the mouse. And after three hours, um, we sacrifice the animal and look at the organs and find out where there's green fluorescence. So we, we, we know where this has gone. Um, so that, that's the experiment. And uh, this one never shows up as well as I'd like it to, but what we're comparing here are uh, tumor tissue where we have stained both for 
the nuclei of the cells in the tumor, as well as blood clots. That's what the red is. So there are blood clots here. And then superimposed over this, and it's really pretty um, uniform, is green fluorescence. So our uh, my cells make it from the tail vein of the mouse to the tumor. We can see their presence here. Of course, uh, and we'll get to this uh, a little bit in, in, in a couple of minutes, this isn't exactly what you'd call diagnostic. Um, it is investigative. We, we figure out where these things went, but of course we really need to figure out how to do this on live animals and then eventually on people. Um, if we have my cells that don't have the peptide, they don't get there, so we don't see any of that. Uh, we've done this a lot of times, and I, I apologize that this doesn't show up well. It's just the, I've got to figure out how to get more compatibility. But these are tumor tissue with green fluorescence on them and a very good overlay between the two. If you could see this better, you would see the one big problem with this, which is that there is green fluorescence in the liver. Um, and that could be a serious problem. Um, we haven't really followed up uh, sufficiently on this to know. But some of this ends up in the liver. Now, not much else ends up anyplace else. These are very small. They don't get sequestered or filtered out in the spleen very much. And we don't find anything in, in really any other tissues uh, of the mouse in substantial uh, degree. If we don't sacrifice the animal, a large uh, fraction of this comes out in urine after over the course of eight hours or so. Uh, we haven't done a detailed mass balance on these things to know where everything goes, which is something that will have to be done if we start to take this seriously. And we do take it seriously, but if we really want to get, I guess if we want other people to take it seriously, <laughs> is, <laughs> if we want like real doctors to take this seriously. <laughs> sure. We haven't yet, but that's a good idea. No, I understand what you're saying. We just haven't done that yet. Uh, we've worked with a few other peptides, also discovered by phage display. It does turn out, by the way, that um, cyclic peptides are, are frequently more effective in this. So in fact, what we have here is something that where there's a linkage between two terminal cysteines. Uh, and these things not only, so in the, in the Krika peptide, it binds the blood clot. So it doesn't go into cells. It doesn't bind directly to cells. It just binds in the general neighborhood of the tumor. But we have other peptides, and Erkey has been developing this angle where they can be internalized into cells. And what you're seeing here is a kind of a distributed green fluorescence that has penetrated uh, cells. Again, we get uh, you know something like uh, 7 to 8 nanometer spherical particles. Um, so. Uh, that's uh, encouraging. Um, it raises all sorts of questions about you know, how and, well, basically how uh, this happens. I mean, first of all, we've injected these things into a volume of circulating fluid in the mouse that uh, dilutes these things well below the critical micelle concentration. So these things are going to come apart at, at some point. Um, and, uh, you know, but it, we think that they got there, and let me just show you why we think they got there, because we did um, a, a follow-up kind of experiment, both with Krika and with this LIP1 peptide, but they both show the same thing. So if we have fluorescent label but no peptide, we don't get anything. But when we use micelles formed from molecules that either have the fluorescent label and the peptide on the same molecule or on different molecules, we get about the same uh, effectiveness of targeting. In other words, the fluorescent label doesn't have to be covalently bound to the peptide in order to get there. The micelle seems to carry it there. If, if this thing came apart, then the fluorescent molecules would be separated from the peptides. And we know the fluorescent molecules don't get there by themselves. So our conclusion is that the micelles get there. So that's uh, point number one. I'll come back to a little bit more uh, information about how these micelles come apart. Um, Erkey has been looking at other kinds of peptides and using our micellar kind of uh, technology. So he has peptides that, you, again, you can't see very well. This is a, a, prost a human prostate xenograft um, where uh, 
Uh, some peptides will bind to the cells at the periphery, at, at the cell membrane, but not uh, penetrate. Others, uh, in particular, Erke is very excited about this uh, penetrating RGD-containing peptide that can penetrate into these things. And he's actually used this to image uh, with my cells um, um, a pancreatic tumor in a live mouse. Uh, mice are small enough that you can see fluorescence uh, outside the body. Human beings are not small enough to do that. But at least, uh, you know, for uh, other kinds of studies where you do not want to sacrifice the animal, fluorescence might be uh, a possible route. The long-term route is to use our peptide micelles uh, to uh, carry some kind of contrast agent uh, to the site that could be uh, used with uh, CT scanning or uh, N MRI or PET scanning or something like that. And we're working on that uh, to use metal ions, metal ion chelators, and I, I think we have a good chance of being able to do that. Of course, they end up in the liver, they're toxic, there's, there's all sorts of things we might have to worry about there. But I believe that we'll be able to at least demonstrate that we can uh, get things there and do more practical, eventually potentially practical for human kinds of imaging in uh, live uh, animals. Um, so we can do targeting. We have some ideas about diagnostics. The other thing you'd like to do is therapy. And uh, obviously, these multifunctional kinds of objects, um, you can put m multiple components in. So we have a tumor targeting peptide in a micelle. What else might we want to put in there? Uh, something that kills cells, um, something maybe that uh, e either kills cells with a peptide or kills cells with a drug. Um, and uh, what, what kind of... Uh, thing are we thinking about there? Well, uh, the particular peptide that we've decided to start to explore is a very potent toxic peptide that is called CLAC. Uh, that is also the sequence. Um, we don't say CLAC, CLAC, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's a lysine, leucine, alanine, lysine, re repeated uh, twice like that. Um, this also forms uh, an amphipathic helix that has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic face to it. And these kind of things are very cell disruptive. These things kill cells. Uh, so what we've been working on is, you know, could we incorporate a very potent cell killer like this into a tumor targeting my cell uh, so that when it got there, it would kill the tumor? Uh, the obvious problem is, how do you keep it from killing everything in its path on the way uh, to the tumor? And for that, you know, we have decided to, I'll just skip over this, decided to see what we might do with protecting it. That is, keeping it short, not extending it out like the tumor targeting peptide. So this could be the CRECA and this the CLAC peptide. And put a protective PEG polyethylene glycol hydrophilic polymer around it. And we've only done very preliminary experiments and not in animals, which show that while these things are very potent in killing cells, if one incubates cells with these things. If you put the PEG uh, brush canopy over these things, they can be left in contact with cells in culture for up to two hours and washed off without killing the cells. So, I mean, that's not a, a huge step, but at least it gives us some feeling that we might be able to carry an extremely toxic peptide through uh, the, the necessary uh, circulation and, and organs that it has to get through to find these tumors and not uh, wreak havoc. Time will tell on that. But that's, that's the kind of philosophy that we are exploring now. We have targeting. We, we need to worry about sort of uh, toxicity along the way. And uh, uh, we have, I, I think, some preliminary uh, ideas about how to use this for diagnosis and therapy. Um, let me come back to this question of stability, um, because it was one that concerned us. Um, how long do these things stay together? And uh, in particular in blood, not just in uh, simpler fluid, because blood, uh, among other things, has proteins such as albumins that are designed to transport lipids. So we thought that, you know, perhaps these things would come apart very fast in blood, or could, um, 
So we did some experiments that was really Mark Kastentin's thesis where we took the piece of the assembly that had the fluorescent label and the peg spacer and the lipid and looked at the uh, micellar disruption essentially by injecting them into very dilute solutions, either in protein solutions or into pure water. Um, and the experimental uh, observation is fluorescence dequenching. The fluorophore at high density in the micelle uh, self-quenches. And so when the micelle comes apart, the fluorescence per molecule increases. So one could monitor the increase in fluorescence on dissolution. And uh, if things are simple, which they're reasonably simple, the fluorescence should increase with a single exponential that gives you a time scale for how these things come apart. And interestingly, um, if you do these experiments at kind of room temperature, around 20 degrees, these things come apart rather slowly, no matter whether you put them into a protein solution or pure water. And in fact, they come apart, seem to come apart more slowly in the protein solution. But at physiological temperature, and I didn't realize that when we first did these experiments is that physiological temperature for mice is 39 degrees, not 37, but we did them at 37. Uh, they come apart in 8 to 10 minutes. So uh, I'm not going to give you a conclusive explanation, but I'm giving you two facts. We know that my cells get there from the experiments that I showed you, and we know that they probably come apart in 10 minutes or so, so they must get there within 10 minutes. That's not unreasonable. I mean, certainly the blood flow, the rate of circulation in a mouse would uh, allow that to, to be the case. So that's, that's, you know, we know these things come apart. There's lots of things we can do to manipulate this rate of breakup uh, using other tails, uh, using other, with other peptides and, and so on. So this stability and breakup is actually very sensitive to the exact molecules that we use. Okay, let me shift to another pathology, which is atherosclerosis. Um, this combination of diagnostics and therapeutics that we're uh, uh, aiming for and created this really ugly sounding word uh, called theranostics. Um, but it is an important problem. I mean, could we do some of the same kinds of things that we're shooting for with cancer, with heart disease? And um, as I said, there's, there's some strong motivation to do it. In each case, of course, what we're, we're talking about is asymptomatic disease. We would like to detect cancer before there are symptoms. We'd like to detect heart disease before there are symptoms. Um, and um, there are people who know a lot more about this than me, but a particularly dangerous form of heart disease is one where the atherosclerotic sclerotic plaques that form are so-called vulnerable or unstable, which basically means mechanically weak. Uh, and they rupture uh, before they occlude to a sufficient extent that their symptoms, chest pain, leg pain, where whatever, whatever kind of uh, symptom would be caused. And if there's a rupture, there can be a catastrophic event and it can lead to uh, death or stroke or uh, other kinds of really bad consequences. Atherosclerosis is a disease of the wall of the blood vessel, not just fat laying down on the inside of the blood vessel, but uh, a combination of inflammation and deposition and oxidation of lipids that uh, find themselves uh, getting buried within the cell wall with a fibrous capsule covering it, which does have a tendency to rupture and produce little blood clots on the surface of these things. So in fact, the same peptide that we've used to target cancer, we've, uh, I will show in a second, has some utility in targeting uh, vulnerable plaque. So I, this is the same slide I showed. I called it tumor targeting, protein analogous micelles. Now I'm calling it plaque targeting. Same thing, same deal, same reasoning. The mouse model is a kind of a standard one again, which is a genetic knockout mouse that is prone to atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, again, this isn't showing up too well, but it's this fatter mouse on the, on the right uh, that not only has this genetic uh, knockout, but also has been fed a high-fat diet for several weeks. And uh, I think you can probably see that even under those circumstances, the lumen, these are the cells in the blood vessel wall of the wild-type mouse, is clear, but the APOE knockout mouse has large plaques, although not, you know, majority occlusive yet. 
uh, on the inside of blood vessels. And so we do the same experiment. We inject and after three hours sacrifice the animal and excise some of its blood vessels. And what you can see, and again you can see it a lot better on my computer than here, is that uh, our my cells light up the inside of these blood vessels. So same kind of physical chemistry going on, but it's targeting a different thing in this case. If we do <clears throat> one of several kinds of control experiments to see if this really has anything to do with CRECA, for example, uh, we do an experiment where our my cells have CRECA on them but no fluorescence label and we uh, expose the animal to that and then we put in our fluorescently labeled CRECA my cells and now they don't go there. That's because the unfluorescently labeled CRECA has taken up all the binding sites. So we think there's some, some promise here. Uh, we can also look, you know, really inside the lumen of the blood vessel and there's an interesting fact here that might actually be helpful in understanding the, the pathogenesis of the disease and that is that uh, the CRECA fluorescent micelles are really found in most high concentration right at the corner of the plaque. That is where the, the capsule over the plaque rejoins the normal blood vessel lining. That's also sites of highest local inflammation and where there the, seems to be uh, a concentration of clotted plasma proteins. That's why the micelles go there in the first place. That's what they're after. So uh, I think there's really some utility in, in pursuing this uh, in the same spirit. We've made one kind of very limited uh, foray toward therapeutics with this, which is to in <coughs> incorporate into a mixed micelle a peptide called Herolog, which uh, essentially uh, reacts with uh, blood clotting proteins. I'm not actually suggesting this is therapy. I'm not really suggesting that this is a way to treat heart disease. What I'm suggesting mm -hmm. is that we can show that uh, the CRECA targeted micelles can deliver this uh, thrombin, this anti-thrombin activity to a micelle. So we can show that Herolog is carried to that micelle by the CRECA and shows activity there. Um, what we really need is, you know, some really good idea of what to do once we know we can get micelles there. And I'm not, I don't think chewing up the blood clots is actually the right thing to do. It's probably something in the neighborhood of reducing inflammation or, or something like that, or carrying away lipid or, or something like that, but we'll have to figure that out. So uh, that's the story on vulnerable plaque. I, I wanted to close with a little more physical chemistry, um, just to show that we're really trying to pursue different angles here. But uh, so I'll start on, on this point. It's actually pretty hard uh, to make stable spherical micelles out of these peptide lipid conjugates. What happens when you crowd the peptide in this assembly is that the lateral interactions between the peptides accumulate over time. This is a kinetic process. It can be actually a kind of a slow kinetic process, but you very frequently find a transition from an alpha helical peptide, and this is one uh, that is modestly alpha helical at the start, but turns into beta sheets. So you, you have something that starts out alpha helical in a spherical micelle and transforms to beta sheets and the micelles elongate and become uh, worm-like micelles. And that, that can be useful for uh, a, a lot of uh, applications. There's lots of reasons to want to have, for example, an entangled network of worm-like micelles. But in fact, what happens with the peptide that I just showed you, which is a decent alpha helix former, is that we start out with spherical micelles, and over time, it transforms into a mesh of worm-like micelles, largely because of the peptide interaction. So this micellar extension and, uh, and beta sheet formation uh, go hand in hand. Uh, a very interesting fact that I'm not going to dwell on, but we're trying to figure out, is that this transition can be rapidly accelerated by shearing the solution of spherical micelles. And I, I'm not sure why that is, uh, but, but it's a very striking effect. So there's some interesting physical chemistry going on in this transition. The, the viewpoint that I want to take for the next three or four minutes before I close is that we don't want extended micelles. We want little things that can circulate. <coughs> and so we want to avoid this kind of transition. And so um, 
Brian Lynn and Rachel Marullo in our group have thought of another way to make spherical particles out of micelles, uh, out of uh, peptide amphiphiles that left to their own devices would form worm-like micelles. And that is to template them on the surfaces of hydrophobic, highly branched polymers known as dendromers. So these are dendromers that are chemically synthesized in, in our labs, uh, actually in, in Craig Hawker's lab at Santa Barbara with Rachel and Brian uh, doing the work. Uh, and the color scheme might not show up here, but they're tipped. Uh, maybe in the next slide has this, which you might not be able to see in color either, but they're tipped with a C8 uh, hydrophobic tail at the periphery. And by proper control of mixed solvents, you can uh, bring these things together and form a templated nanoparticle. Um, we have to work on the, the name, but the, you know, Rachel has started to call these protein resembling templated nanoparticles. <laughs> Isn't exactly uh, poetry, uh, but uh, uh, there you go. Um, and, you know, we have, um, I'm not sure what that yet means. I think that's a mistake. Uh, we have uh, tried this with the B-zip peptides that I showed you that form on their own these worm-like cylindrical micelles or a nuclear localization sequence that forms vesicles on its own. So what we do is take these things that don't want to form little spheres but want to form extended or flat structures and um, essentially devise a solvent uh, a sequence of mixed solvents in which we can coat these things on the surface of these dendromers. Um, and uh, they, um, uh, this happens above a critical concentration which is lower. That's maybe not such a, an important point. When we do this, we get uh, very, we get almost identical secondary structure. So these are micelles above the critical micelle concentration and these are the same peptides coated on the dendromers. They're both highly alpha helical. And uh, we get a fairly narrow distribution of uh, sizes and shapes. The shapes are spherical. Um, the size distribution is a little broader and they're a little bigger because of this big fat dendromer in the core. But we get 25 nanometer particles with a distribution of one to four or so hydrophobic dendromers in the middle. It's really hard, no matter how you handle these things in solvents, to keep these really hydrophobic surface dendromers from aggregating. But we, we seem to be able to get a small and relatively narrow size distribution. So this is another effective way, not only of making spherical particles, um, but also of uh, preserving secondary structure, which might be uh, important for molecular recognition and, and some kind of targeting. In the Krika example, we hung these things out on, side of, on, on the end of a long hydrophilic tether. And that was fine. Krika has no secondary structure. It's not an issue there. But we found with other alpha helical forming peptides, and I didn't put these data in, that if it's helical um, in this kind of peptide tightly coupled to lipid, aggregate, if you start to hang the helical peptide out on a longer tether, more uh, configurational entropy, less order. That is, looser tethering loses order. Uh, so you don't, that's not, for peptides where the ordering of the peptide in the secondary structure is important, loose tethering to create spherical particles isn't always an option. Whereas this templating thing seems to hold them in tightly. Uh, and these things can be taken up by cells um, in, in a similar way uh, to my cells um, as well. Um, they're, they're quite uh, stable, so if we do this experiment of taking these uh, protein resembling templated nanoparticles and throwing them into dilute water or BSA solutions, they actually last longer than micelles. It takes a little longer for these things to come unglued from the surface of a dendromer than from a micelle. It's not, it's not huge, but it's, you know, maybe doubling the amount of time. So there are subtle effects on the stability of these things that I think we can learn how to exploit. And uh, we've also looked at a, at a kind of a fluorescence anisotropy experiment. Uh, that uh, is, is another kind of physical chemistry experiment that shows that we get small aggregates, not necessarily spherical. What we're looking at here 
is the rotational diffusion time of DNA that's fluorescently labeled in the presence of these things. And if um, we don't have the dendromer templated things, the anisotropy just keeps getting bigger. So you know these things are tethered to increasingly big uh, aggregates of DNA and uh, worm-like micelles of uh, peptide amplophiles. But if we have the dendromers present, this thing plateaus. That is, we come to a kind of a steady state rotational diffusion rate, which is characteristic of the hydrodynamic radius of these uh, spherical particles. So uh, that's it. Uh, I've taken you through you know, really a work in progress about how we're trying to tailor and understand the physical chemistry of these kind of peptide amplophile micelles and bring them to some utility in uh, biomedical applications uh, as well. Uh, I think these things are pretty versatile uh, assemblies to mimic protein functionality. There's a really interesting interplay that I think we can understand more about protein folding even with a model like this uh, between the interplay that I'm talking about is between the assembly structure that you get that is spherical or worm-like or um, and, and the secondary structures, helical or beta sheet. I think these things are, you know, arguably the smallest, most potent, very flexible, and sufficiently stable nanoparticles. And we have several routes, actually, to ensuring that we can get small spherical particles if we want them. It's easy to make multi-component assemblies, and I haven't gone into this, but there's other chemical <coughs> ingenuity that can be applied. For example, there are ways in which you can attach two different peptides to the same tail through uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, ligation kind of uh, chemistries so that you could have micelles that display more than one peptide but every molecule in the thing is identical if you're worried about internal phase separation inside the structure of the, uh, of the micelle or something like that. And we think that there's both applications to understanding protein folding and to targeted diagnostics and therapeutics. Thank you very much for listening to me. think it's a bad idea. I think we really ought to test that idea. And, and we will when, when we you know, have, have, I think, a, a good test. Um, I don't, the, the test isn't targeting, is, is what I'm saying. And, and targeting is the only thing we sort of know how to do. The test is, what do they do once they get there? And is it helpful for them to come apart once they get there? And we need to have you know, some better uh, feeling that we have good things to measure about what happens after the micelles reach their target to know whether we want them infinitely stable or not. Yeah? I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is, um, you've been focusing on micelles, but the way cells often deliver things is through vesicles. And so you kind of trap them inside. And you can imagine that you could layer one side with one peptide and the other side with another peptide if you want to have that sort of thing. So have you, um, are, there, are there sort of size constraints that have prevented you from thinking about using a secular structure as opposed to this micellar structure? Uh, only pretty simplistic. Uh, I don't think prevented would be the right word. It's been a judgment call that we've been trying to focus on what we think are, as I say right here, the smallest kind of object that can deliver uh, multivalency and multifunctionality. There's, I don't think there's a conclusive argument that it wouldn't be useful also to look at vesicles. Okay, and then related to that, I mean, one of the problems with this whole approach of using liposome type structures, as you alluded to, is they get trapped in the liver. So um, I haven't actually followed this field for a long time. <laughs> I was at MIT when Bob Langer started to do some stuff. So how, how does one get around those kinds of issues of um, liver trapping? You know, because that, that does seem to be kind of the first place we want to yeah, and I don't know how serious it is with us, honestly. I mean, I wanted to be clear about it. There, we can see them there. Uh, you know, I think as a practical matter of, you know, what do we do if we want to create some practical therapies, I, I actually think I'd like to wait and see about how serious a problem these actually cause in the liver before uh, 
I invested a huge amount in avoiding the liver entirely. Uh, but if you had to avoid the liver, you know, I think um, we haven't really explored the range of compositions that's necessary uh, to achieve targeting. It's definitely not 100%, you know, labeled peptide and things like that. So I think we might be able to get around it by judicious formulation of our peptide compositions. <laughs> <laughs> um, it relates to another application, which is that you've used this as targeting, but the other way that you potentially use it would be scaffolding. And one of the problems we have with proteins as treatments is we can't get them into cells. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way of a kind of um, tagging them so that they can take advantage of the receptor mediated in the cytotic system to get them in. And then as we use them as, as potential scaffolds for other kinds of proteins, we can actually use them as other kinds of inhibitors. Yeah. And, and we're starting to, I mean, we, we, we published a couple of papers on the mechanism of cell entry, and I think there's really some mileage in the direction you're suggesting. Yeah? I, I worked on asthma. In the lung, we have a, a convenient um, way to avoid the liver by inhaling uh, medication, and, and at least concentration-wise, the first pass effects, um, uh, localizing treatment. But there is no blood vessel uh, if one is uh, seeking to target, for example, airway smooth muscle, there's no blood vessel that directly goes there. And also, there's tissue in between the luminal surface and the target uh, tissue. So there are two challenges that we encountered when we tried to do this with uh, less elegant nanoparticles. Um, we're getting the nanoparticle to the smooth muscle, and also then having it selectively act recognize the smooth muscle cells as opposed to other cells around. Um, do, do you know anything about the tissue penetration of, of these very small particles? And also, is there anything that's known about targeting to particular non-malignant cell types? There's a lot known about the latter. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know it, but uh, I know that uh, if you wanted to target many kinds of cell types, I think you could uh, find the right thing uh, to ta attach. I mean, and that's, a, that's a, I think, an advantage. This is really very versatile in, in that respect. You can make many kinds of molecules. So I, 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 there's, there's a lot known by other people about your second question. I, I don't know about your first question. I, you know, I'd probably be thinking about going for I don't know, junctions between cells or something like that. We know how to get things into cells, but I don't think that would do it if you're trying to go from the lung to the vasculature. I mean, getting things into smooth <coughs> muscle cells uh, would generally uh, involve the disintegration of our micelles, the, the, the way it usually happens on cellular contact. So I don't have a good idea about the, the first thing that you're saying. I think we could target smooth muscle cells, but I'm not sure about the rest. Yes, sir. Uh, oh. <laughs> so the uh, great uh, micelle uh, imaging was the atherosclerotic mouse was very interesting. But it raised a question in my mind. If I understood you correctly, it is binding to an epitope shared by fibrinogen and fibrin. Yes. Well, yet, one would expect, I would expect, that there would be a ton of fibrinogen in the blood if it could just bind to any fibrinogen molecule and it would obscure the image that isn't obscured. So it leads me to wonder what's going on. One possibility I'm wondering about is, is it a particular confirmation of the fibrinogen? Is it, is it, does it have to be bound? And for example, fi fibrinogen will bind to platelets uh, at the alpha 2 b beta 3 and maybe that puts it into a confirmation of phage which would make a lot of sense for your, for your seeing it. Yeah, it's a perfectly valid question. I, uh, it's, it's good to bring it up. I mean, I, I wasn't intentionally trying to gloss over it except for speed. We don't know what epitope it binds to. So we should find out. And then I think we could uh, get some more insight into this. I, you, it's a really valid question mechanistically about what I talked about. There was another one in the back there. Uh, speaking of epitopes, um, do you, uh, I'm assuming that the tumor model was done in uh, uh, yeah. In an immunocompetent mouse, you know, had any antibody responses we might get against these materials, whether or not that. No, we don't. I mean, so the question is, you know, what what kind of immune response is raised to these peptides, and we haven't studied that uh, 
uh, very, uh, very thoroughly, or, or haven't studied it at all. It's my curiosity. What do you think about future uh, possible clinical application of such uh, structure, structures based on peptides versus uh, more classic, known like lipid-based or polymer-based? What's benefits or what? Uh, so the, the, the arguments I'm making have sort of already come up in the discussion, but just to, to kind of summarize them. And I don't know that they're right, you know. I mean, I really, I really think that uh, this deserves both some kind of critical review kind of analysis uh, or some people getting together and trying different particles to do the same job, you know, in concert with one another. But I would argue that small size, uh, very, very, uh, uh, you, you get small size by having small hydrophobic tails as opposed to liposomes that have much bigger, stockier <laughs> hydrophobic tails. Uh, and this isn't necessarily an advantage over liposomes, but the modularity or multifunctionality of the micelles are the biggest things they have going for them. Maybe but I think this field really would benefit from some detailed comparisons. Maybe Sure. Well, I, that's why that's what it, that's embodied in small size of what I think the advantage, some of the advantages of size is. Yeah. Carl. Have you checked whether uh, the stuff that goes into the liver is because they're aggregates, or whether by reducing the size of the clusters, you get more going through the kidney and less in the. We we haven't checked, Carl, and uh, I think uh, you know that's one of many things we we should do. It, it, I mean, it's sort of a, a question of whether it's a physical chemistry or biological chemistry that's causing it, and I, I can't tell you. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Raphael had a question, and then we can call it off. So. No, it's okay. You might, yeah. You have the liposome and micelle extreme, but there's like small vesicles. Yeah, that's and, true. And they live for days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they could definitely be a good intermediate point. It, it's a good point. Uh, all the questions of stability, you know, I mean, a, a micelle, I mean, going back to my own physical polymer chemistry kind of roots, is a micelle can be an equilibrium object. A, a vesicle really can't, uh, but maybe that doesn't that's matter. <laughs> Yeah. And they don't become elongated micro necessarily. True. As, as, True. As the, so you have a, the architecture really, you have no multiple, multiple. I hear what you're saying. You Good idea. So Can we take one more question from Raphael? Thank you. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thanks. You know, obviously you can control the kinetics of, of the lifetime of these kind of particles by the stability of the Yeah, I don't, I honestly don't think that polydispersity, as long as it isn't, you know, really extreme uh, in size, is a big problem. I, I really think that this is, the, most of these things, and it's related to the last comment in a way, are probably forgiving to a certain size range. I, I, I mean, I, we've had this kind of idea that smaller is better, but that doesn't mean that a little bit bigger is really bad. So I think it's pretty forgiving to poly I would guess it's pretty forgiving to polydispersity. I think we should invite more questions one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you, Tom.